the most stubborn infections and the type that are often the most difficult to get rid of, the reason that they're so difficult to get rid of is not necessarily because they're so strong at being resistant to the things that would be trying to kill them. And it's more that they're really good at hiding. The thing that these organisms hide behind is usually called biofilm. These organisms will create biofilms. Some of the organisms that we consider to be desirable, beneficial, will also form biofilms. And that's why breaking up biofilms is not something that you want to do just willy-nilly, because if you don't have a problem, you could well make things worse. Hi, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwin Robinson. And today we are carrying on the conversation around infections. So this is part two. So if you haven't seen part one, please go check that out. And in this particular episode, we're really looking at and diving in on the various different types of infections that you may suffer from or, you know, come across in your lifetime. So we're going to break it down and go into greater detail. So Elwin, tell me, one, where do you want to start? And two, you know, carrying on this topic and going into it in great detail, you know, what's, what, why did you want to bring that to everybody today? Yeah, so uh, I definitely don't want to rehash the last episode. As you said, we've really covered a lot there. But just a quick reminder before we go into this of the difference between acute and chronic infections. So acute infections uh, can be potentially life-threatening, even something as mild as, you know, a cut finger or, or something like that. And so uh, with any kind of infection or suspected infection, you should absolutely go and see a doctor. Um, they can literally save your life. And we talked about that in the last episode, how um, the rate of death by infectious diseases has gone down massively uh, in the last 150 or so years, and how the medical establishment has got at least a significant impact on that, maybe um, maybe a majority, that's debatable, but whatever. Um, and that's something that they're generally good at. So even if you're very resistant to doctors, if you have an infection, go to the doctor. When we're giving this advice in this episode about chronic infections, we're talking more about the kind of infections where um, your doctor is not interested because they have deemed it to be not acute. They either are not interested in exploring to see if you have an infection, which happens in some cases, or because it is in an area that is that very rarely turns life-threatening, like your sinuses or whatever, um, they are not, you know, that interested. They just tell you to go home and rest or whatever. And so it's for those kind of people in those kind of situations that we're offering this episode. Once you've gone to the doctor, if they say there's nothing you can do, or they just tell you to rest and drink fluids and stuff like that, we'll give you a little bit of advice for a few extra things that you may want to consider. Um, as well as in some cases also where you may want to go to a specialist that, um, has more understanding of how to help a specific kind of chronic infections. And so I don't want to give a lot of advice about chronic infections in general because they vary so much depending on where they are. Just a quick reminder, uh, chronic infections will be in areas that are technically outside of the body from the immune system's point of view. As soon as it crosses the barrier um, into what your immune system considers inside your body, so crossing the uh, the barrier of the skin and being in contact with blood, basically, that would be a simple way of putting it. Uh, that can always be an emergency because if blood gets infected, that's sepsis. And, um, and also, of course, the blood goes everywhere, so the infection can spread everywhere. So, uh, yeah, that's always an issue. So the chronic infection areas that we listed last time are the mouth, the skin, the lungs, the sinuses, the ear canal, uh, the urethra, sometimes including the bladder, depending on who you listen to, um, and the whole digestive tract, including intestines, stomach, duodenum, esophagus, uh, even the tonsils could go in that category. Some people put them in the um, respiratory category, uh, but you know, in either case, they're, uh, um, what's the word, next to the esophagus, so I'm putting them with the digestive tract. Uh, yeah, so that whole system, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So while we, I'm going to give different advice based on um, different areas, I thought I could like start with just classifying the different area, uh, the different types of advice I want to give. So I would classify these very broadly as either uh, tools for hygiene, 
So meaning sometimes in order to deal with an infection, you just have to literally wash the area out in one way or another. So I'd call that hygiene. Um, second category I'd put them in is removal. So this would be in the area of, uh, you know, killing different organisms and uh, also potentially helping to transport them out of the body. Um, then the third category I would call like uh, either a soothe or rebalance. Um, and so as we talked about in the last episode, infection and inflammation really go hand in hand. And if they don't, there's something terribly wrong. But a lot of the symptoms of infection, a lot of the suffering is actually caused by your own immune system by that inflammation, not necessarily the infection. And so we want to soothe that excess inflammation by bringing the immune system back into balance. Um, and then the fourth category is a sometimes category. I guess just like hygiene is also a sometimes category. Uh, sometimes we want to focus on recolonizing as well. Like once we've gone in there and kind of blowtorch the area and uh, <laughs> as, as well as uh, bringing things back into balance, we may also want to encourage some uh, beneficial organisms to grow, but not always. Okay. So then really looking at, depending on, well, any infection that you're having, you're really looking at these four areas, the cleaning it out, the hygiene aspect, then the taking it away, you know, taking out the trash, removing it, and then allowing the body to recapitulate, do what it needs to do, and then potentially bringing back in the um, the bacteria or allowing the body to um, recolonize or allow itself to grow back into its healthy state. Yeah, allow more of the good or at least um, neutral stuff to grow back because th they will sometimes in some situations keep the pathogenic uh, bad guys um, in their place to some degree uh, yeah so and just to clarify all of that is um, after doing what we talked about in the last episode which is strengthening the whole organism potentially cleaning out the whole terrain of excess toxicity all that kind of stuff all of that stuff would come first because when we're talking about chronic uh, infections again we're talking about stuff that a doctor has already decided is no big deal and that they're not bothered about right so we're not talking about anything that's um potentially life threatening or, or even serious we're just talking about something that over time could really ruin the quality of your health but not something that can't wait a couple of months for you to you know maybe bring your hormones into balance maybe cut different things out that are poisoning you excessively all of that kind of stuff that we talked about in the last episode getting more sleep you know whatever all of that kind of general but very good advice this is about specifically how do we deal with the actual infection assuming we're already in a place where we're strong enough where that's a good idea which is not a given by the way as we talked about in the last episode um in many cases i don't believe in starting with a remove protocol with with again, non-serious, non-acute chronic infections. Um, first of all, because the chances that you'll feel worse when you try and remove uh, an, an infection is substantially higher when you are weaker or when, you're, when your terrain, when your overall bodily orga uh, organism is low in energy and low in vitality, you're more likely to suffer. And also, it's less likely to work, meaning um, the issue may just come right back or maybe all the stuff we're talking about doesn't even work. It, you know, it never even goes away in the first place. So doing that strengthening yourself first is really important. Um, so the different classes of tools that I'll be recommending today, let's just go through those quickly. So hygiene tools, you know, uh, something like a toothbrush would go in that category, very simple. Uh, herbs and also herbal uh, extracts of various kinds, so different compounds which are ultimately extracted from herbs. Berberine is a famous one that we've talked about before. Um, enzymes, these are used generally. Uh, so when we think of enzymes, uh, people watching this, generally we think of digestion, you know, breaking apart food. People who've watched a bunch of these episodes of Rejuvenate Podcast might also think of the more general category of uh, the little chemical factories inside our body that turn one compound into another, which is the, the broadest definition of enzymes. But here I'm actually talking about a very specific use of enzymes that does apply to infections. So the most stubborn infections and the type that are often the most difficult to get rid of often 
the reason that they're so difficult to get rid of is not necessarily because they're so strong at being uh, resistant to uh, the things that would be trying to kill them, whether we're talking herbs or antibiotics or whatever. And it's more that they're really good at hiding. Good point. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> so playing hide and seek over in areas that potentially when we're trying to clean them out, our body is not able to because they can't detect them. Yeah, absolutely. Or they even can detect them, but they can't get to them, literally. Like white blood cells, you know, it's, try, it's like it's trying to break through a uh, fortress, you know, like uh, there's like a siege <laughs> situation going on. <laughs> so um Enzyme. So uh, the the thing that these organisms hide behind is usually called biofilm, and this is actually the same everywhere throughout the body. That every area we're talking about, except for arguably the skin, but you know we're talking about the mouth, the digestive tract, uh, the, you know the sinuses, all of these kind of areas. The body will, uh, sorry, the these organisms will create biofilms, and it gets complicated because there's quote unquote good biofilms and bad biofilms. Um, so some of the organisms that we consider to be desirable, beneficial, will also form biofilms. And that's why breaking up biofilms is not something that you want to do just willy-nilly. Because okay. if you don't have a problem, you, can, you could well make things worse. But if you definitely have it, and you know, I'm a big fan of testing for that reason, as we've talked many times about in our uh, podcast episodes, uh, but if you know that you have it, it can be a really effective tool. Um, often not the first thing to try, but it can be a, maybe not last resort, but you know something to try down the road. So we'll talk about enzymes if they're appropriate. And when you say testing, you're you're referring to testing for that particular pathogen or infection, yes? Yeah, to, and to make sure that there even are pathogens, you know, because um, as we talked about, the symptoms of uh, an infection are largely the symptoms of an immune system activation. And an immune system activation is not necessarily down to an infection. So you might have all kinds of sinus issues, for instance, uh, but it's an allergy. And so biofilm dissolver is not going to help with that. Um, and in fact, you know, it may just irritate the uh, situation. And uh, it may also be a reaction to some kind of poison that is not um, organism based some kind of uh, you know other poison so again a biofilm dissolver is not going to help with that situation so yeah better to get testing in in my opinion more situations than you know medical doctors do ironically uh, for uh, these chronic infections if it's all possible to test um, then then do basically um, next category would be binders so again like with Biofilm dissolvers, which are called enzymes here for simplicity, even though sometimes there's other stuff as well. Um, binders is a concept that is not as familiar to everyone. So just to quickly explain it. So a binder is something that helps transport something out um, and do so in a way where it doesn't create as much of an issue as if it were not bound. So organisms are to some degree innately toxic but the issue is more that they create uh byproducts which are toxic and so and they especially create toxic byproducts when you kill them when you're in the process of killing them so again as we spoke explained in the last episode uh different organisms kind of fight and defend themselves and attack in different ways and so, you know, mammals will tend to do it like teeth and claws and stuff like that. Well, these uh, microorganisms will do it through chemical warfare. They, they've they been masters at chemical warfare way before human beings <laughs> even walked the earth. And so when you perform chemical warfare on them, whether that's herbs, drug antibiotics or whatever else, they will often Retaliate. fight back with, mm -hmm. yeah, with their own chemical warfare. And so something that helps to bind that chemical and stops it from uh, causing as much damage to the lining of whatever we're talking about and you know stops it ideally from being absorbed as well into your bloodstream, which can also happen, um, is very beneficial. And depending on what the organism is, I mean, binders don't work for viruses, for instance, but certainly you know for some kind of uh, parasites, worms, bacteria as well, binders can help to uh, actually transport them out. Next category I think everyone's heard of is uh, 
probiotics. I'm just going to call them probiotics, even though we might mention a beneficial yeast in there because 99% of the time it is bacteria we're talking about. So beneficial organisms. Um, there's some controversy about whether beneficial organisms are go in the category of recolonizer we talked about earlier or if they're actually more in the category of removal. Um, I don't think that that science is settled yet, and I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. But I'll say certainly more than you might think. If you are taking a beneficial bacteria, say, to help with, I mean, any actually, there are many times of issues, but let's say classically a digestive issue, and it helps, it may not have helped because it has colonized your intestines. It may have helped more because as it's passing through, it's fighting, again, chemical warfare, the pathogens that may be, um, that it came across during its journey. So a probiotic doesn't have to colonize to still have a very beneficial effect when it comes to um, uh, chronic infections. And in fact, it doesn't actually have to be alive. I'm going to come up with at least one example here of something that is uh, very effective when, when actually it's a dead probiotic. Um, but nonetheless, it, the probiotic has created, again, a byproduct, in this case, a good byproduct, which is very effective at dealing with a certain type of infection. Yeah, you brought up a really great point here because as well, going back to our last episode that we were discussing, um, about terrain. So when we're working on recolonizing, I mean, the terrain has to be acceptable to the organism that we're trying to recolonize as well. So that that probiotic, whether it recolonizes or doesn't, as you just said, has very helpful aspects um, that can do it. And until that terrain can sustain as well that bacteria, then, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. That's true. And it does also adjust the terrain. So a lot of probiotics um, the, one of the reasons they're considered uh, beneficial is because they excrete uh, lactic acid, sometimes other acids, so they make the environment more acidic, which in the case of intestines is actually beneficial because the pathogens seem to thrive in more alkaline environments within the intestines. Um, so yeah, even if they don't recolonize, they can potentially make the environment more hospitable for some other beneficial organism to recolonize at some point. So it can all get a little bit uh, complicated, but yeah, let's not worry about it. Yeah. So probiotics are <laughs> uh, potentially in the uh, in the arsenal tools that I'll give. And then so are peptides. Talked about those before in a few episodes, so I'm not going to spend a massive amount of time on them, but we know there are some peptides that help with the uh, soothing rebalancing part of the process that we talked about earlier. Um, and then minerals and amino acids. There's a few cases I'm not just going to recommend things because they're generally good for the area, like things that are generally good for skin or sinus or whatever, but I will recommend them if they specifically do help with a chronic infection. And there are a few cases where that is the case. And then last but not least, um, I'll put pharmaceutical drugs. Like there is a place for them in some cases. Um, there are some which uh, you can get over the counter and there are some which need to be prescription. Obviously, I cannot uh, advise about taking any of those, just like, you know, all of this is for information purposes only. But I can point you to, the, you know, kind of like those ads that they are allowed to have in the US, like, ask your doctor about. So I can say, you know, these are things that I personally have used and I have found to be beneficial or have heard good things about from clients. And it's something that you may want to consider, uh, often that are not the standard thing that, uh, like a normal GP would give you, but the specialist might be inclined to use. Beautiful list. I know we have a lot to get through. So um, where do you want to start with, Elwin? Because we're going to really focus on the external areas, as you mentioned. So are we going to go top to bottom? Uh, I've got a kind of random order here. So yeah, um, let's start with mouth. I think maybe not random. I'd pick that one first because it's the place where chronic infections are most common. I've seen estimates of, you know, 95 to 98% of people have a chronic infection in their mouth, at least at some point. The tooth is usually more of an acute situation. Um, it's more of an emergency, but it's more infections of the gums, which are uh, more of the chronic and uh, potentially very problematic. So generally dentists will focus on teeth and then hygienists will focus on gums. 
sometimes good dentists will also focus on gums, but that's kind of generally like how the responsibility is uh, allocated. So we did a whole episode on oral health already. I won't do like a massive thing about that, but I just want to give some advice for chronic infections and we'll do that for each of those areas. Um, so in terms of uh, removing bad guys, you know, really your number one uh, tools are the ones that everyone tells you to use, which is a toothbrush. Um, and also I'm a big fan of interdental brushes, or if that doesn't work for you because you have very small gaps between your teeth, then floss. Um, but floss should really only be used if the interdental brushes don't fit. I think every hygienist and dentist these days pretty much uh, agrees about that, that the interdental brushes are better just because, you know, um, a very thin string is not going to be effective at removing debris as a uh, as a, a brush. And so this is kind of a combination of uh, hygiene and then removal because, you know, a brush is going to be do both. It's going to, um, like, uh, help to flush, wash, you know, uh, whatever, brush away uh, the amount of bacteria that are on there as well as the plaque the biofilm that they hide behind uh but yeah some kind of um herbs i would say are really really good as well to help to break up the biofilm and to uh help to kill those organisms you don't want really to go scorched earth in the mouth is the overall conclusion I've kind of come to. So I'm not recommending any kind of alcoholic mouthwash here. From okay. what I've seen, the research I've seen, um, it's a bit too much. So I'm a big fan of a brand of toothpaste called Uncle Harry's. It's got calcium carbonate, which is kind of the, the same thing that they all do, and some clay, which would go on the category of binder. But the thing I really like about it is it tastes great and it's got herbs that are very very effective at um helping get rid of the bad organisms without going scorched earth so it's got you know a little bit of cinnamon a little bit of clove i think some of them have a little bit of aniseed some of them peppermint spearmint cinnamon is a very interesting one we tend to think of that as either culinary or we think of it as um uh maybe as blood sugar balancing because of the whole research around uh, when you add cinnamon to an apple pie, they discovered it spiked the blood sugar a lot less, which they eventually decided was probably down to chromium, a potentially um, beneficial mineral, although that's still disputed. Some people say it's not that beneficial. But anyway, but another be uh, beneficial thing that cinnamon does is it helps to get rid of some organisms and it really helps to disrupt biofilms. There's something about it that it stops uh, pathogenic um, organisms from being able to communicate with each other as easily. Like it disrupts that communication matrix. And so, uh, and also it tastes great. So yes, I it does. <laughs> we can't really see any downside to using a little bit of cinnamon essential oil in your toothpaste unless you use too much. And that's why rather than giving a recipe. And I think even a drop of cinnamon oil or a drop of clove oil is going to be excessive. And so it is better if it's pre-formulated by someone else who makes sure there's not an excessive amount to me. Although I'm sure there's someone out there who teaches you how to make your own. And, you know, if you want to do that, then that's great as well. Uh, neem is another one. Neem is a little bit more scorched earth, but if you really want to knock back the level of uh, organisms inside your mouth, without uh you know fully going for the antiseptic route then neem is a good one as well in terms of uh binding charcoal is pretty good some people like to brush with charcoal there are again pre-formulated as well charcoal toothpastes out there and uh i'm a big fan of those my wife is not because it stains the uh, yes. sink if it's too high a concentration in charcoal so Sometimes uh, I do compromise on that one, but if you haven't got anyone who cares about the state of your sink other than you, uh, then charcoal is certainly uh, very good for your teeth. A lot of people use it as well to uh, whiten the teeth because it, of course, works more for toxicity than it does for organisms specifically. And a lot of the toxicity that exists in the teeth does seem to have a kind of yellowy hue to it. So uh, charcoal is good for, for that point of view as well. So people talk about using turmeric for that purpose. I've personally not found that to be effective, but I'm sure you'll find people on YouTube who are recommending that. You can always give that a try if you're very experimental. 
Um, so remineralizing is also good. I'm going to put that in, even though it's more general oral health in the category of chronic infections, because you know chronic infections in the teeth do grow where the uh, mineralized um, boundary of the tooth has been worn away usually by acids, either acids in your food and drinks or acids which are created by bacteria. And so something that remineralizes, that helps that enamel, uh, that protective barrier grow back on the teeth, I would say is good from a at least preventing and possibly even very early stages helping to deal with a chronic infection of the teeth. So Remineralizing basically means um, toothpaste that contains either like calcium hydroxyapatite or zinc hydroxyapatite are seen as well. Calcium is the natural version, but you know zinc is beneficial as well. And then to be honest, even fluoride, although I'd never use it in a million years, that is still one of the things that it does. It's the only thing that you could say about it that is a genuine benefit is it does help to remineralize and, and harden the teeth. Um, I would not use it because uh, of the damage it does to the thyroid gland and the brain and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, it's but, classed as a neurotoxin, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still recommended by nine out of ten dentists. There you um, go, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. hopefully that will change because, you know, calcium hydroxyapatite is what your body naturally uses to strengthen and, you know, uh, mineralize your teeth. So why would they recommend something that is unnatural rather than something natural? And I do see a bit of a trend in dentists for you know recommending the natural form now because i think they can also make money out of it there's like big brands that that do it that are in partnership with dentists so so that's good that's a good trend and you know speaking of that i suppose i should touch upon this like having mercury in your teeth is going to be something that supports the uh, growth of pathogens mercury is one of those things that pathogens uh build biofilm defense shells out of so getting mercury out of your teeth if you have any in a safe way because removing them in an unsafe way is worse than just leaving them um, is something that you may want to consider as well if you have chronic infections in your mouth either gums or teeth really um, and then you know the probably the uh, least how do i say it popular recommendation that i often make to people in in my kind of sphere, sphere is dental care, right? Going to a dentist, going to a hygienist. Most people don't want to do it, but it's absolutely something which I would say is beneficial for preventing and resolving chronic infections. You've got to understand that with the mouth, the main cause of chronic infections is that because of the nature of the teeth it's uh, and, and gums, it's so easy for food, for pathogens to get stuck somewhere, right. either between the teeth or between the fold, between the gums and the teeth. And so really hygiene is nine out of 10 of preventing and resolving chronic infections in the uh, oral sphere. Sometimes, you know, there are other factors which are more important, but usually it's the most important factor, even though everything else I said can also be good. So obviously doing your own hygiene is important. But yeah, especially if you've got crowded teeth and, you know, certainly if you've got gum disease, I think over there you call it periodontal disease, all that kind of stuff. Um, actually going to regularly see someone to do a deep clean is a very good idea. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenate me for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenate me at feelyounger.net. 
So uh, you mentioned earlier a, a few of the um, the things that we can do, brush the teeth using certain herbs and um, how to do those things. I, I wanted to ask you, because there's, you know, oil pulling. Yes, it's, it's more uh, coming from the East. So I wanted to ask, would that be something that could be beneficial here? <laughs> it's funny. Um, I didn't include it in the oral health episode and uh, I had questions about it. And then, you know, I was looking at... Um, can't remember some kind of google search or something and it's the most searchful thing i wish it worked because apparently it would make me popular on youtube but from everything i've seen all right so what does it do oil does attract certain toxins so um it could be beneficial because wherever the, the more wherever there's more toxicity pathogenic organisms tend to thrive more it's not only mercury and so from that perspective yes um it's true that some things like coconut oil uh, olive oil have, you know, mild antifungal, antibacterial properties. The thing is, I I wouldn't actually use it to try and resolve any kind of infections on its own. Like, there's no harm in doing it. The other thing is, it's a it's a hassle. You know, you got to keep this oil in your mouth for at least ten minutes. Um, so, to me, the kind of cost plus hassle plus time to actual effect ratio is poor like it, it it's not worth it to me and i'm not i'm not averse to keeping something in my mouth for 10 minutes because i do that with the remineralizing toothpaste like that actually has an effect that is significant and so to me that's worth it but holding oil in your mouth the people who claim that it like resolves all of this stuff um i don't see any evidence that's based on now Obviously, there are some people who anecdotally they have done that and they've experienced that and it's been beneficial for them. And then that's great. That's fantastic. But, you know, we've talked about before in episodes of the, the power of the mind and the power of placebo. And that's not to dismiss it. That's fantastic. I, I would say probably praying to have a healthy mouth for 10 minutes every day is probably actually and, and visualizing yourself having a healthy mouth and all the rest of it is probably going to be more effective than oil pulling for 10 minutes a day um, because the power of the mind is significant. So that could always be added to every <laughs> list. Um, but yeah, oil pulling in and of itself, I don't think so. And is there anything that could potentially go wrong with the mouth, with the things that we're doing here? Are there any kind of, you know, things to look out for? I have the things I've recommended. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least in this, yeah, do keep asking that question because there might be something on this list, but in terms of everything I've listed for this particular thing, for the mouth, not really, as long as you follow the advice I said. I mean, if you use too much clovers for foil, that can be an issue. If you have bleeding, it can like cause uh, uh, excessive bleeding. And um, But I'm trying to think. Charcoal can stain your sink. I've already said that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, not, not really. Oh, the only other thing that I'll add that is significant is... Um, so I said that debris is the uh, main re cause of chronic infection in the mouth. The other thing is acids, right? Um, and the acids are both a cause and consequence of chronic infection in the mouth. So they're a cause because the pathogenic organisms thrive in an acidic environment, and they're the consequence because those pathogenic organisms create more acid. Uh, but they are uh, potentially a cause as well. And so learn to breathe through your nose, Basically, if you're not talking, you really want to be breathing through your nose. If that is your standard that you live by, that's going to help. And that's going to mean that you're less likely to breathe through your mouth, especially at night. Nine times out of 10, if you wake up in the morning, if your mouth feels dirty enough that you feel that you need to brush your teeth or whatever when you first wake up, that's a sign to me that you either have some kind of um, chronic infection in your mouth or you have some kind of chronic infection in your intestines, which is then venting into your mouth, or could be neither of those but you're sleeping breathing through your mouth and when you breathe through your mouth your mouth becomes dry and when your mouth becomes dry the alkaline saliva that should be bathing your mouth and your teeth becomes obviously dried out and then the bacteria which are always there to some degree they start to proliferate and then they create that funky smell so uh yeah i would say uh, you should wake up first thing in the morning and have absolutely no bad breath whatsoever. That's a sign of a lack of chronic infections in, in the mouth, stroke, digestive area. That's a good point. That's a good sign to look for. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Beautiful. 
So um, moving on to the next one, I believe that might is going to be skin, correct? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so skin, I'll go through probably quite quickly um, because it doesn't have that tendency to biofilm as far as I know because it is an external skin. Every other thing that we're talking about, whether it's the mouth, the digestive tract, whatever, is an internal skin because it's an external skin. It doesn't really have that issue because it's in contact with the air and with the sun the oxygen is quite a powerful <clears throat> uh, antipathogen agent. The sun, the UV light, is quite a powerful antipathogen agent. So aquatic infections are less of an issue on the skin than they are in these in, you know, internal skins. But of course, it can still happen and, and does all the time for various reasons. Um, you know, weak immunity and stuff like that is really the, uh, the key thing. And potentially damage as well. So... Um, I had uh, an error. I broke my foot a few times, and that's where some toenail fungus grew. And it, it, despite what they say about how fungus can spread, and you have to be careful, I never spread to the other foot. I never spread to anywhere else. It was only ever where I broke that foot repeatedly. Um, and I think that's because you know the whole area is damaged. There was probably uh, um, less circulation going in, less circulation going out, a little bit less vitality, and that was enough for it to get a foothold. So yeah, advice for the skin. Um, yeah, first of all, what kind of infections can you have on the skin? You can have fungal infections, you can have bacterial infections, you can have uh, viral infections. I would say those are the most common. Um, even, uh, you know, what they call a uh, ringworm is actually a fungus, not a worm. Um, so what can you do for the skin? In terms of hygiene, uh, you know, obviously there is washing, but I would give a um, special mention to sauna. And also bath, steam. So basically anything that makes you sweat will help the skin's health in general. But the reason I mention it in the context of chronic infection specifically is because often one of those root reasons why you would have a skin infection despite the skin, as I said, being less hospitable to infections than some of these inner skin areas is because there's toxicity clogging up the pores there. And that could be a reason why infections will nonetheless grow in the skin. So if you are regularly uh, detoxifying the pores through um, making yourself sweat, that's something that is beneficial and reduces the chance of chronic infection. Speaking of that, another thing that helps to clear out the pores is, you know, all kinds of the, uh, the different scrubs and stuff like that, treatments that are out there. But Pre more preferable to me would be something like a poultice, especially if it's a specific area. So uh, a poultice is basically where you take a binder of the type that we will talk about or have talked about, uh, clay being well known, but charcoal actually being another one that you can do. And then you add water to it. And then you take this paste and you apply it to a specific area. And that will very powerfully um suck toxicity out of that area and it will also through some mechanism that honestly i haven't fully understood but have absolutely experienced it really significantly reduces inflammation i don't know if it is only through um lowering um the toxic burden i mean that could be the explanation but i'm saying i don't know if there's anything more to it necessarily but it's very very powerful uh, the time before that I had the infection in my ankle that I think I talked about in the last episode that was, you know, definitely potentially life-threatening, nothing worked for that other than um, a clay poultice in the end. That was the only thing that brought the infection and the inflammation down from this ankle that was swollen literally three times the uh, diameter of what it should have been. Um, and then also when I had my dry socket, which is extremely painful, um thing where a blood clot doesn't form properly and you're too fast you've had it extracted and it's got a high potential of getting infection and all the rest of it it's one of those ones that's famous for nothing kind of reduces the pain on it and no painkiller worked uh for me it was you know barely even worth bothering and again the only thing that reduced the pain on that was actually doing a clay poultice on the area of the mouth where the infection was. So there's something about it that is very powerful for reducing inflammation. And I haven't really suffered with any significant skin issues, but if I did, that would be personally my go-to thing to do first, to do either clay or 
charcoal or some combination, actually both poultice, um, because of those experiences I've had that it's really, really effective for that. Um, more standard things that are recommended, which are also good. Um, aloe vera is good. You know, famously, uh, it can help to soothe, obviously, with burns and stuff like that. But it does have a bunch of different uh, antifungal and antibacterial agents in. So it's a very good um, from that perspective as well. Honey famously has a uh, strong antimicrobial agents in it. So that's something that a lot of people swear by. Coconut oil we talked about earlier. Uh, again, the holding it in the mouth, too much hassle for me, but I would say putting it on the skin because even if it doesn't have a super strong antifungal antibacterial action, what it does also have is a very nice, strong skin nourishing action. Hydrating, so, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I would go for the coconut oil, even if it may, you know, probably not resolve an infection on its own because it could help. Um, and, uh, I have not uh, seen people do it, but I, if I had a fungal infection, something that I would try as well maybe is MCT oil, which is especially the C8 MCT oil, because that is caprylic acid, which is a classic kind of uh, antifungal agent. And that actually is strong enough that it can make a real difference. Whereas there's not enough C8 in coconut oil, I think. But yeah, it's not... It's not massively low in coconut oil, but it's it's not high enough that it really seems to be effective. But pure CA, I would say, definitely could be. Uh, neem, we talked about for the mouth. Uh, that's kind of one of the classic Ayurvedic things. Neem could be really um, effective. Tea tree oil uh, is another one. Oregano oil. And all of this, I mean, I'm talking about it in the context of the skin, but this could all of these could be applied to the nails as well. And nails is where chronic infections are more stubborn and more difficult to remove. And so, yeah, everything that I just said, the poultices as well, and then, yeah, everything on that list, except for maybe honey, are things that you uh, that could be very effective for uh, toenail or uh, fingernail fungus as well. Yeah, good point. I mean, that is out there, are cracked heels or things like that, where the fungus or any kind of something could take hold, like you said. So those are all really good good suggestions. I wanted to ask, does psoriasis or eczema fall under this category of, of infections or is that something separate? So they can be again. And as we talked about in the last episode, it's often not even investigated. Psoriasis tends to respond really well to uh, sunlight. And if you don't have access to that, even UV light, like tanning booth light, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not an infection, though, because UV light is a powerful uh, anti-infectious agent. Um, dermatitis, that just means, derma means skin, and titus means infection, uh, sorry, inflammation, so that just means inflammation of the skin. That means that, you know, that they have no idea what causes it. Um, eczema, I, f I believe, is often considered to be an autoimmune thing, but I... Uh, but I uh, and I believe rosacea is often in that category as well. But I would n not be surprised at all if there often is an infectious component to it. I think it's based on a case-by-case -case basis. Unfortunately, these names are more uh, related to how they present and not what causes them. So I would say, especially if the standard recommended things like a cortisone cream or whatever you've been given... Uh, are not effective or if the issue comes back as soon as you stop taking them, then that could be a sign that there is an underlying infection. But as we talked about in the other, in the previous episode, the best way to diagnose an infection um, in some cases, and I think skin is one of them, is to actually try an anti-infectious agent and see if it helps, see if it makes a difference. I prefer to test if you can. But I don't believe that, you know, the skin infection, skin like uh, eczema or psoriasis or whatever are commonly tested to see if there's an infectious component to it. So I don't actually know if it's something that you can even order privately, honestly. That's something I might have to look into. So as far as I know, the way that that's usually addressed is just um, try something and see how it goes. A couple more recommendations. So, yeah, we just talked about um, how skin is less likely to have these issues because it's got contact to sunlight and because it's got contact to oxygen 
Well, you can enhance that, you know. So two things that can also be effective are UV light treatment, either just going in the sun or, if that's not possible, uh, using some kind of sun lamp. There's this idea that sun lamps are like fundamentally bad. And I think I kind of held to this as well. Though I've kind of gone back and forth over the last 15 years or so. But someone pointed out something interesting to me not that long ago. They said um, most of the studies that have been done that talk about the benefits of sunlight are actually done using lamps that replicate sunlight, right. not sunlight. <laughs> because, you know, the way scientific research works, things have to be, you know, very tightly controlled right so going out and hoping that the sun comes out and all the rest of it is not a scientific researcher's modus operandi so they use lamps so like a good quality lamp that uses that emits uva and or uvb light uvb is more for vitamin d3 um stim uh, stimulation uva is more for uh, detoxification and tanning and also uh, as far as I know it's the one that's better for killing the organisms as well and so a tanning beds lamp will be more UVA sometimes only UVA uh, and then the vitamin D lamps I do see getting more popular now are like mainly UVB or only UVB um, so yeah that UV light ideally naturally that would be another thing that's beneficial for the skin and then in terms of oxygen, ozone, you know, um, you can do ozone treatment on the skin. Some people get in like a tent where their whole body is in this uh, being immersed in ozone except for the head. That's very important because ozone can damage the lungs if you breathe it in. Um, so that's another way potentially of addressing these things that I would say actually I've left it till last, but those two things can be more powerful in many cases than, than herbs and stuff. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. And then um, would there be a time or a case for pharmaceutical use to treat these kind of skin infections yes um i mean i think the antibacterials i haven't listed here because i think they usually come under emergencies if you have uh, a bacterial infection that's bad enough but there's certainly like chronic fungal stroke yeast kind of infections that can go on for a long long time without being serious if they're not addressed um so most commonly i see like fluconazole uh, used for that in this country at least. Uh, terbinafine is then recommended if uh, if it doesn't go away. But terbinafine is strong. It's harsh on the liver. I would personally use that as a last resort. And then the type that I see usually like functional medicine doctors use as like a first resort would be uh, a nice statin. And so that would be the one I would ask your doctor about as like a starting point. But again, not generally the first that I see like a normal medical doctor using. I, I think they would usually use like a fluconazole. But, um, and it, it is a little bit case by case. So if, if your expert tells you this is the type that's better for you, fair enough. But I'm just saying if you go to a conventional, conventional doctor, they might just give you not the best just because it is the default thing that they give out. And there's a cost factor in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And too, I mean, I guess like you were saying about the mouth as well, 
no need to go scorched earth. So potentially on the antibiotics or things like that too, it's like, okay, case by case basis, what is the level of potency that we really need to do here? Because that's also going to have a an effect for the overall terrain for all the microorganisms in the body, potentially. If they're oral, right. uh, yes. If they're oral, yeah. Um, if they're creams, then to some degree, because of course things are absorbed through the skin, um, that's you know something that bizarrely <laughs> the uh, kind of skincare industry has managed to con its way into uh, uh, not admitting that that's why they can get away of putting all kinds of things in skincare and cosmetics and all the rest of it and hygiene products that they'd never be allowed to put in food because they say well it doesn't go through the skin uh, that's despite the fact that they sell nicotine patches as you know that's a, an allowable drug because obviously it does go through the skin so that's kind of some nonsense that hasn't been uh clarified it works like that but out. it doesn't work for this it's fine <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless something that's topical is definitely going to have way less systemic effect than you know if you're if you're trying to resolve a skin issue by swallowing a pill yeah it's going to affect the whole system so uh yeah i would put that as a last resort um a systemic oral antibiotic or antifungal definitely and then within the skin is as uh you know are there potentials where things could put go wrong with everything i've recommended uh really i mean the ozone if it's not administered properly uh again you got to make sure you don't breathe it in even a little bit accidentally really maybe that's going to sound over the top to some ozone experts but you know a little bit can go a long way with UV light, it can absolutely burn you if you have too much. It is the very type that everyone warns you about. <laughs> it's dangerous. So you definitely don't want to have an excess amount of that. Even with everything I've recommended, I mean, I suppose not really aloe vera or coconut oil and stuff, but neem, tea tree, oregano, or if you use too much, if it's too strong, they can also burn the skin. That None of those are going to leave any lasting scars or anything, I don't think. Um Unless they were, unless you went crazy excessive with them, but they could certainly be, be detrimental if you overdid it. And of course, as we just talked about with the pharmaceuticals, they can definitely be detrimental, and there's a whole host of side effects for them. So I wouldn't use them as a first resort. Clay and charcoal poultices are probably the only thing that are completely safe. I've not seen any, you know. I mean, they dry the skin out. I guess that's the only thing you could say about them that is less than optimal. But if you were to moisturize afterwards, that could take care of that. Uh, I suppose even a sauna and a bath, if you're too hot for too long, you can, you know, come out and fall over and crack your head open. So always be careful with everything. Well said. <laughs> well said. So next we're moving on to sinuses. So this I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interest because the colds, flu, winter time, things coming up. So um, what are the variations here for sinuses? So sinuses, uh, I think we classically think of like viruses, like a cold, but sinuses could also be bacterial infections and often the most stomach sinus issues can be. Uh, they can also be fungal and they can also be mold. You can have a mold colony inside your sinuses, which is uh, really bad news if that's the case. So, yeah, there's a bunch of different stuff that could be going on in there. Everything other than really parasites, I think, are fairly common in the sinuses. So, yeah, there's various different ways that we could be addressing it. So if we talk about hygiene first, um, so there's the famous neti pot. Um, which is where you, you kind of get a teacup thing and you're pouring water into your sinuses. Um, and in that, you could put some of the remove agents, although you have to be a little bit careful to not put too much because you can definitely burn your sinuses and create a different problem. So the first thing, actually, I mean, let me just go back and say, you can definitely have issues with your sinuses for reasons other than a chronic infection right so one way of being able to tell of course is to do the treatment and see if it works or not but ideally you can test for the sinuses and ideally it is better to do a test to see if that's what's going on because it could easily be an allergy an intolerance it could easily be um, some kind of toxicity excess situation as well so yeah, um, I'm a big fan. I've got I got a sinus rinse machine the other day. Sinuses are my kind of weak spot. It's like one of my um, areas where if I'm not perfect health, it shows up first that I have issues. 
And so I like to do a sinus rinse sometimes. And it's basically like a neti pot, except for it just blasts uh, water up there through, um, it's got like a, like a, what's the word, like a spray. So it's not actually, what I don't like about a neti pot, it just feels like you're kind of, I don't know, drowning, right? Because you're not really meant to have water up in your nose. But this is like, um, like a like a mist of water, so it's less like feeling like you're drowning and more like a, like a cleaning action. So I kind of like that. I mean, it's a bit of a luxury. Yeah, I was going to ask because it sounds like when you say it's kind of doing its own thing with a pump or spraying it up, I was like, it's, it sounds like it could be uncomfortable. What I'm hearing is it's potentially not because when you say that, I automatically... To me, it's less. Okay, good, good. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, everyone's different. But to me, I prefer it because rather than just pouring water into your nose, you are doing a fine mist. Um, the other thing is, you know, generally sinus problems will show up in one of two ways. The, the more obvious, I mean, there's always inflammation, but the more obvious one is blocked nose. So when you have a lot of mucus up there, but the, and you know, people struggle to breathe for their nose and stuff like that. I don't really have that. I have the other type, which is where it's dry. Um, and so when it gets dry, uh, that can sometimes in many people it causes symptoms of headache, but I don't get that. For me, it just kind of causes like weird symptoms sometimes, like feeling dizzy and it's just like an uncomfortable feeling that I wouldn't class as pain, but I don't quite know how to define it. Um, so for me, like a bit of mist up there, you know, just helps to uh, lubricate it as well. So I like that aspect of it. People most commonly put salt in there. Salt is a good idea if you have an infection, uh, but it is a bad idea if you have dry sinuses. Because salt is sodium chloride. Chloride is a very drying material. So putting salt in a neti pot or anything else and putting it up your nose is not going to help if your issue is uh, dryness. But it can definitely help to um, move mucus if your issue is more blockness. I'm glad you brought that up because I always thought that you had to use the little powder packets when you were doing the neti pot. So I just thought, oh, that's how it is, water and the, the salt. But no, I'm glad you you said that because, uh, yeah. Definitely not, no. I mean, there's an argument to be made because most water is uh, perhaps not clean that if you put water up there, you will have something in there to make sure you're not adding any other infectious agent. Um, but I was going to suggest, so if, you, if dryness is more your issue, I prefer to use xylitol. So xylitol is something... Uh, there's a great product called X Clear, which is just a little spray, nasal spray bottle that you can buy and, you know, put up your nose as well if you're on the go or whatever. Um, but that is basically just a combination of water with a little bit of xylitol and a very little bit of grapeseed extract, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and, uh, but you can do, so that, you know, that's just doing one or two or whatever sprays, but sinuses are actually huge. They're like these big caverns inside your head. So you're definitely not addressing the whole surface area of the infection with just a spray of anything, a Sudafed or anything else. So whereas using one of these devices that, you know, really sprays up there, you can actually coat the whole area with something, whether it's salt or maybe it's xylitol. Um, you can also use grapeseed extract. Grapeseed extract is an excellent antifungal, antibacterial as well. It's very powerful. It's one of the only ones I'd recommend in the list because a lot of the other powerful ones that we'll talk about in the intestines, like garlic and or oregano, cinnamon, clove, uh, whatever, neem, all the things that we have talked about and will talk about, they're all too harsh to be <laughs> in the sinuses, even Such in very a low amounts. Such sensitive area. Yeah. 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 You're going to burn them. So grapeseed extract seems to be one of the only things that doesn't burn the hell out of uh, the sinuses a dose that's still effective for actually addressing an infection. Uh, another thing that belongs in that category as well is silver. Um, silver is a powerful antibacterial specifically. So silver, as far as I know, is not going to be massively effective if it is like a mold or whatever, but it is powerful for a uh, bacteria situation. Uh, just humidity in general is good for the nose. So for the reason that we talked about, oh yeah, let's explain this. So we talked about biofilm. So the nature of biofilm is innately, well, the nature of the type of biofilm that pathogens create is dry. It dries out an area. So 
if um, if you have a biofilm issue, that's where xylitol is really effective. Xylitol is very good at breaking apart biofilms. And it's because it's good at breaking apart biofilms that it's also effective at dealing with that dryness, if indeed dryness is what you've got going on. We talked about that in the mouth earlier, although I didn't call it out specifically. I said, you know, if you're breathing through your mouth, then the whole area becomes dry. And the more dry it is, that leads, um, it, it makes it much easier for the pathogen to form biofilm. And in turn, it also makes it feel more dry even once you are breathing through your nose again. Like So the two go hand in hand. Um, and so xylitol, I didn't mention in oral health, but I did in the episode, xylitol is a good thing for breaking up the biofilm in the mouth as well. Xylitol and erythritol. And both of those are actually often used by dentists. Um, they, uh, the hygienists, they'll they'll do like a, a very powerful, concentrated like air spray of uh, sodium bicarbonate, and then often they'll use like a erythritol of xylitol to really deep clean like the whole area between the teeth and the gums and stuff like that. But it's breaking up biofilm. That's what it's so good at. So xylitol um, is good for that purpose as well. Um, also, so other than that, for breaking up biofilm, are the enzymes. So uh, cellulase breaks up cellulose, which is uh, something that especially um, like yeast and fungus uses to protect itself. Um, protease breaks up proteins. And again, the, the um, organisms often use protein bonds to form these protective shells around themselves. And then there's uh, bromelain and papain, which come from pineapple and papayas. And so you can use just pineapple and papaya. <laughs> that also works. Or you can use the uh, like an enzyme supplement. And a lot of people swear that that really helps their sinuses because, it, again, because it helps to break up that biofilm. So a lot of the issue with the sinuses does seem to be that the organisms that thrive there will use the biofilm to protect themselves. And if there's just a biofilm, then that often result in, as I said, that feeling of dryness. Um, whereas if your immune system is really trying to deal with it, if there's not so much biofilm, then that results more in the mucus because that mucus is largely composed of dead white blood cells, which are you know involved in that fight. So you can kind of tell if the infection is dormant or active by whether you're on the more on the side of dryness or whether you're on the side of um cloggedness let's just say <laughs> <laughs> good things as well peptides thymosin alpha one thymosin beta four we talked about those many times before thymosin alpha one more to support the immune system thymosin beta four more to uh reduce the inflammatory response of the immune system from being excessive although both are good for both and then lastly, you know, pharmaceutical-wise, um, one of the things I've seen recommended a lot in mold forums is people giving a shout-out shout out to something called a BEG spray, which is this combination of EDTA, which is another biofilm dissolver, uh, plus an antibiotic called uh, mupiracin. I'm actually not quite sure how to pronounce it, and uh, gentamicin, um, which are very effective for the uh, antibiotic resistant in general staphylococcus which often makes its home in the sinuses and then is just really really difficult to remove and deal with so um, that's something that i think the average doctor is probably not going to know about but it's something you might want to ask your doctor about if you've tried everything that i've already said many times before and none of that has helped and then and you know, if you get tested and you have that staphylococcus, then that could be your solution at last. Because none of the other stuff I have just listed, as far as I know, will work for that. Yeah, these are all really great points. I want to just uh, share with you, like a long time ago, I used to, whenever it was cold and flu season, things like that, I would get chronic, or at least three, four times a year, chronic sinusitis. It would uh, just always happen. I actually went to the doctor, talking to him about it, and they said uh, they suggested or recommended surgery to go in and clean out the sinuses and do all of that. And I was like, I don't know if I want to go to that invasive space. And I don't quite recall how I got onto this, but, and so the, your insights here would be great. I started doing a series of colonics. And once after I had done that, then, you know, 
that pretty much cleared cleared my sinuses up, it bar the odd, you know, um, cold or things like that. But it wasn't chronic, you know, every year because that was just antibiotic after antibiotic with no real solution. So any any thoughts on why that worked? Uh, yes. I was going to get into that more when we talk about the uh, stomach, okay. believe it or not. All right. Um, so we'll so yeah, ask there. me when we get to that one. I will yeah. do. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, just to call it, but no, you've, you've asked me at the right time um, because yes, Everything that I just said presupposes that the root cause of the problem is actually in the sinuses. That's not necessarily the case. If the root cause of the problem is in the digestive tract, then obviously nothing you can do to the sinuses is going to resolve the problem because the problem isn't in the sinuses. <laughs> um, we talked about that a little bit with the mouth and the digestive tract earlier. But yeah, there's absolutely something similar going on with sinuses. But I'll, I'll go into more detail with that when we get to the um, stomach. So with the sinuses, are there any instances where things could go wrong? With these recommendations? Um, yes. You know, you want to be careful of those kind of devices Basically, putting anything up your nose, know, you could irritate it and make it worse. So be very careful with that. Um, nothing could go catastrophically wrong unless you're literally stabbing yourself or something, as far as I'm aware, though. Um, with the enzymes, th if you have stomach issues and digestive issues already, they can potentially make it worse, um, especially if you have acid reflux. Because uh, the way that most of those enzymes work, the ones I just listed, protease, bromelain, and papain, they break down protein. And so if you have reflux and you have these enzymes, they can come back into the throat and then they can start to eat away the lining of the esophagus and even um, go back up into eating away the, the mouth and the sinuses and all the rest of it. So... Things can definitely go wrong with that one if you have any kind of reflux. You want to be careful with that one. With the drugs, obviously, there's there's a big list of side effects always, so you always want to be careful with those. I did have a quick question about the mouth and the tongue specifically as we were talking about it. Um, so because there's a lot of times where you see a coating on the tongue, whether it's white, whether it's yellow, things like that. So I wanted to get your opinion on, you know, if somebody notices and they, you know, wake up in the morning, they see their tongues completely coated white, you know, what's that an indication of? Yeah. So I didn't address that yet because again, to me, that's a reflection of the digestive tract, not really the mouth. Um, I wouldn't see that as a reflection of a mouth infection per se, um, although it could contribute to a mouth infection. That's more of a reflection of biofilm in the whole digestive tract and potentially infection in the whole digestive tract. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So we've got a lot to look forward to on that digestive <laughs> tract. <laughs> yes. I, I've, I've left it till last because I figure the other ones are fairly quick and simple to go through compared to the digestive tract. Obviously, as we've talked about before in different um, episodes there are many cultures that do believe that the root of all disease is in the digestive tract and there's a strong case to be made that that's not that much of an exaggeration as we've talked about in previous episodes and when it comes to infections it's definitely true too so yeah uh they will and your digestion will affect every other area we're talking about not just the mouth and the sinuses because they're connected but also the skin uh everything so looking forward to it <laughs> So next on the list is lungs. So are there different variations here for the lungs that somebody would have to be concerned about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's some overlap. Um, uh, I'd say viral, bacterial, uh, mold are more common in the lungs than uh, fungal, as far as I am aware. So, uh, but the advice is different, right? There's no lung washing kit <laughs> like there is a sinus washing kit so there's not much you can do in the way of hygiene for the lungs um obviously for lung health in general i recommend to you know uh not over breathe as we've talked about before in the episode about buteco but that's not really relevant for chronic infections so i'll leave that there um so good herbs to help with the lungs uh mulein is one of them i think i'm pronouncing that correctly I've not, not actually heard anyone say it out loud. I've only read it. Um, M-U-L-L-E-I-N. Uh, it's probably a number one lung herb that most herbalists recommend. In fact, uh, it's so beneficial for the lungs, I've even seen some herbalists recommend to smoke it. Um, it's still is beneficial for the lungs. So, yeah, I guess you can't get much more beneficial for the lungs than that. 
Um, so, but that has some anti uh, antiseptic, antibacterial properties as well. Echinacea is, you know, famously recommended to uh, boost the immune system in the case of a viral infection. So, we've got to remember with viruses. We talked about this a little bit in the last episode. Um, antivirals usually are not kind of killing the virus; they're more um, supporting the immune system or making an inhospitable environment for the virus because what viruses do is, t- you know, take over your own cells. Uh, so echinacea would be an example of boosting the immune system. There's elderberry, which is um, uh, used as an antiviral. Uh, do not use anti uh, elderberry just raw if you see it growing outside, by the way. I did that and then... Realize that it's only supposed to be used if it's cooked. Um, so it is poisonous. Learning curve. Not heated. Yeah. So I've had, I, I mean, I told someone this and they said, oh, I used to read them and it wasn't a big deal. I don't think it's a massively big deal, but it can be. So, you know, to be on the safe side, never have them unless they're cooked and prepared. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's uh, lung wart is another one, lung supportive with some degree of uh, antibacterial action. And then kind of ones that are more common that people, uh, you know, everyone knows about, uh, ginger and garlic. Um, They have an action of uh, also being um, antispasmodic, especially in the case of ginger. So a lot of the suffering with the lungs can be when it goes into spasm. So it's good from that point of view. Uh, Garlic is a very powerful uh, antibacterial, antifungal. So, you know, it's good from uh, that point of view. And all the enzymes we just talked about, for breaking up biofilm are effective for the lungs as well. So bromelain, papain, and protease especially. And then the peptides we talked about, phymosin alpha-1, phymosin beta-4, and humidity is good. So you can't squirt water into your lungs. Well, you definitely shouldn't anyway. <laughs> uh, but you can breathe it in, and that's often one of the things that's recommended. Some, you know, often things that are recommended, like a Vicks Vapor update, the... the um, the kind of different herbs that help to that are expectorant that open up the lungs and uh, cause the movement of uh, mucus are potentially beneficial as well just in helping to clear the debris so kind of as binders i suppose even though they don't really buy anything but just to help kind of move stuff along and move stuff out of you and probably the most interesting category of stuff that i won't talk about anywhere else is the the russian antivirals so viruses really are the main chronic, mm, okay, maybe vi- viruses and molds would be the main things that cause chronic issues of the lungs. Bacteria in the lungs usually cause more acute issues that require medical intervention. Um, but, you know, virals, viruses, usually if your doctor thinks you have a, a lung virus, they will either give you an antibiotic, which makes no sense at all, or they will give you nothing, right? They'll tell you to go home, rest, drink fluid, stuff like that. Um, in the Western world, the Russians actually developed quite a lot of different, very interesting antivirals that seem to be pretty effective, of which I've tried a handful. Um, so cycloferon is one. It increases the um, interferon aspects of the immune system. Um Trekrazan is another one which I've used numerous times, which I think is really good. Um, immuno, uh, those are both uh, capsules. Or I think there's several different forms of them. Um, immunofan is a nasal spray. Um, Arbidol is uh, another one. Um, yeah, and I think those are the list of ones that I've actually tried. I would say for me, zero side effects. Uh, and I'm someone who's very sensitive to, you know, any kind of pharmaceutical thing um, and very effective. Uh, I would say there was one time where I already had a, like a cold and it didn't immediately resolve it, but it still reduced symptoms. And then in other times, um, I kind of felt one coming on and then I've tried different things like that and they've. Uh, especially cycloferon and trekrazan, I personally have found very effective. So I personally, even though most people wouldn't because, you know, it's un- alien and unknown, I would prefer that to an antibiotic, which is kind of irrelevant for a viral infection. 
And I would also prefer them to, you know, a lemp sip or whatever, these kind of standard uh, Western things. Uh, I think that, you know, there's a few things that the whole, the Russian medical system kind of diverged from the Western one, you know, after after 1945. And so there's a few things they, they developed that are superior to ours. And I'd say antivirals might be at the top of that list. They're very, very interesting and very effective. Um, generally not available outside of Russia, but there is a company that ships them within the US, uh, which we can link to underneath for people who are interested in trying those things. Again, they're drugs. I wouldn't do it willy-nilly. I would definitely get the approval of your doctor. Probably if they're a totally mainstream doctor, they're not going to approve. But certainly I have a um, private doctor who is a medical doctor, but also functional medicine and stuff. She's very, very well qualified. And she is quite supportive of these kind of compounds as well. Um, so again, open-minded doctor who's actually willing to do research, they will see that these things are very good. Uh, yeah, so I think with lungs, that's probably it for my list, Chrissy. As I said, chronic lung issues, um, I would say, are less common. If if a person does have long-standing lung issues, it's more repeat acute infections, and we'll talk about those later. But you know, having said that, there's no reason why you should just have to suffer through a flu or a cold, and those are some of the things that I would do to prevent and especially if you catch them early. You did mention a few things to watch out for, um, especially with the elderberry, and then obviously with the um, Russian antivirals to really have support there with your medical you know, professional. But would there be anything else for anybody to look out for? Yeah, I think that would be it. I mean, you know, the enzymes I recommended, I gave the warning about those earlier as well. So, yeah. Beautiful. Next, we are moving on to ears. So what variations are we looking at here for ears? I don't have a lot to say about this because I think chronic infections in the ears are um, that don't really happen. It's pretty much always a, an acute situation. But I just wanted to give a couple of little tips. Um, rinsing out the wax in there is a very good, a proactive approach to be addressing that. Uh, rinsing is definitely better than using those Q-tips as a lot of people, even doctors warn. The problem with that is you get a bit of lin little bits of the material stuck in there and that can actually make things worse. Um, you could def you can go to a doctor and get them to rinse out your ears. They usually won't do it unless, uh, it's bad enough to affect your hearing. But you can also get a uh, home ear rinsing kits. And so that is something, you know, in the hygiene category that a lot of people don't think about. But certainly if you, you have chronic infections that affect your ears, I think that's more likely than having it only in the ear, then rinsing out the wax out of your ear is a good idea. Partly also because that wax is a buildup of combination of, uh, you know, a, dead white blood cells and stuff like that and then toxins so you want to get that debris out of there um to stop it attracting more infections and then you know silver is potentially a good thing i would not put like all the herbs we talked about oregano and garlic and all that sort of stuff in your ears but silver can be a good thing for addressing infections in the ears and can hydrogen peroxide um like very diluted i won't give an exact amount of recommendation but there's something you can look up now i've given you like the thing to, to uh, investigate but really i would say in most cases i would be looking at antibiotics um as far as i'm aware bacterial is the primary type of infection that you get in your ears i don't believe you get like a fungal or anything else in there and then let me ask you this i mean i have seen some devices that you can buy where it has a little camera and you can do it from an app and do, have you seen anything like that i haven't but but that sounds interesting um, wait, so you got a camera in there and what yeah, else? Yeah, so apparently there's a camera on the tiny end of the tip and then you, I guess you have an app, uh, on your phone so you can see what the camera sees and go in and kind of clean it out. I, I, I have no personal, I've never experienced it. I've just seen an advertisement for it. I but don't what know. What are you cleaning out with? Is it still a Q-tip or is it something it's else? It's well, like the, the, the head of it. Um, I don't know. It's whatever little attachment they give you that's on the device. So it just kind of goes in and helps pull it out. But. I don't know the validity of these devices, so I can't speak to them, but I, I've just come across it and th thought, that's interesting. But I'd still be concerned whether something could just get fall off, stay lodged in the ear. I don't know. 
yeah. Yeah, as much as you don't want to be poking around in anything, ideally, like it's a lot safer to obviously poke around in your mouth or even your nostrils than it is in your ears. Um, but yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, Chrissy, send me a link to I'll it. I'll send I've you a link. It. Yeah. Um, then let me ask you this, and maybe this isn't the category, maybe it's a bigger systemic thing. Uh, people say t- tinnitus or tinnitus, you know, because th- that ringing in their ear. Would that be something that is a, a chronic infection? Not as far as I know. No, I may maybe I need to be educated on this, but as far as I'm aware, that is either like a physical damage thing or it's a, a stress thing. I've heard some people say it's potentially even a deficiency thing, although I haven't looked into that enough. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, the the chronic infections may be. Um, contributing because it's obviously it's a stress to the ear but uh, as far as i'm aware it's not a cause no okay. and then vertigo i've heard vertigo before too i'm assuming that that's do you know oh, much on that yeah i mean that can be related uh definitely because you know infection leads to inflammation and then inflammation can lead to swelling and then swelling can affect pressure so absolutely vertigo could be a, uh, a side effect or an effect of a chronic uh, infection. And then I know we don't have much here on this one, so I'm assuming that there's really not much to look out for, except for just if you are using the things that you suggested, really um, go with caution, go with care. Yeah, I would say this is, I just wanted to touch on it. Maybe it wasn't even necessary, but um, I'd say ear infections are one of the things that doctors usually will give you something for and like actually help with um so i was more giving the stuff you know sometimes things are resistant to antibiotics that's why i wanted to recommend the vincing and the silver on the hydrogen peroxide in case the antibiotics don't work but probably antibiotics would be my first line with an ear infection anyway right okay yeah and then i mean i know there's a garlic and onions those obvious those have antimicrobial antibiotic um, and maybe anti-inflammatory properties, could that, like a, you mentioned poultices earlier, would that be something that somebody could potentially consider before going down the antibiotic route? Uh, you're talking about sticking it in the ear? No, like um, putting it in just like having the ear rest or some something like that. I mean, I don't know. I was just trying to figure out more natural because obviously we understand antibiotics and what they do, but if there's something else. I mean, garlic and onion are... Uh, to, to some way they're anti-inflammatory but they also f- can be fairly irritating you know if they're in a soft tissue like you know if you try putting it in your nostrils for instance um so I, I don't know about putting those in the ear i don't know if there'd be any value if they weren't in the ear and if they're only near in terms of clay though what you said is a good point of a poultice um i don't know if that would help but yeah that might be something that i would try but again that's not going to resolve an infection that's only going to reduce inflammation um and pain which is still great but it won't resolve the problem beautiful so yeah look into it and find some research wonderful wonderful um so next on the list and i'm particularly interested on this one because it seems to be out there quite a lot um ut and bladder so what are the different variations that somebody would be you know looking at for these yeah uh urinary tract and bladder um as far as i'm aware these are usually bacterial or fungal um both of them are potentially treated by doctors or they usually assume it's a bacterial i think um, and i believe that bacterial is more common first thing i'd say if someone has a uti and or bladder infection is are you sure that you have a uti or a bladder infection so i mean this is a good question with all of them we've talked about you know different cases where it could be something else um in uh, some cases like with the sinuses we did Um, What I see, though, is people who have, you know, you told the story earlier about how your sinusitis went away when you did colonics, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. Well, I have seen that a lot with people with UTIs where they think that they have a urinary tract infection and they, they almost certainly have urinary tract irritation and bladder irritation, at least. They may even have an infection, but like the root of it is actually in the intestines. And when the intestines are cleared out, then the problem goes away. Now, I'm my survey size is probably biased because I'm speaking to people who the usual urinary tract um, interventions didn't work. And so in that case, I guess it'd be more likely that it's something else. But that's something to consider is, is it actually my intestines? And of course, we're going to talk about those um, next. Another thing to consider is, is it actually uh, cystitis? So the difference between a UTI and cystitis is um, a UTI stands for urinary tract infection or bladder infection. 
Cystitis just means inflammation of the bladder and the urinary tract, meaning it isn't caused by an infection. It's just there. Uh, having chronic cystitis, constant pain, as if you have an infection without having an infection, is surprisingly common. And it's very unpleasant. It's, I'd say it's unpleasant in a different way from sinusitis. Sinusitis is kind of unpleasant because it's right in your head, so it can affect your sight and your thinking and stuff like that. But the urinary tract is more painful, I would say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very, very debilitating. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. So cystitis can be down to a bunch of things, like um, chronic tension related to the fascia, for instance, squeezing that area. Uh, too tightly restricting blood flow there and allowing maybe a lactic acid to build up there or allowing other toxins to build up there as an example. So there's other potential things it could be, just like with a sinus thing. Um, so if nothing works, nothing the doctor's given you is worked, nothing that I recommend to you is worked, then those are things to consider. Uh, but anyway, let's go for some recommendations. So uh, the, the kind of classics... Uh, cranberry is the most commonly recommended really because it contains D-mannose uh, so D-mannose is a type of sugar uh, aloe vera is also high in D-mannose I think we've got uh, an interview coming out or already come out where we'll talk more about uh, aloe vera so aloe vera is actually a perfectly legitimate alternative that could also be very helpful for that um, but the way that D-mannose actually works is kind of more like a binder rather than a removal thing um, It the E. coli which is one of the most common things that causes both intestinal infections and uh, urinary tract infections is uh, attaches. It feeds on the amylose and it attaches to it. And so it's kind of a way of uh, flushing it out of the bladder. That's understood to be the mechanism by which it helps. Uh, Uva Ursi is um, frequently recommended as well as a kidney herb, uh, sorry, kidney and bladder herb. Uh, also actually recommended less commonly, but as effective for intestinal infections. And uh, it's especially helpful for Klebsiella, which is the other infection along with E. coli, which is often antibiotic resistant and often creates problems in multiple different areas. E. coli tends to affect the intestine and also the bladder. Klebsiella tends to affect more the intestine also, well, I'd say actually affects primarily the um, respiratory tract like the lungs and but also significantly the intestine but it can also affect the um, bladder and uh, that's one of the uh, things that Uvarus is good with. Uh, solidargo also known as golden root these are like the classic bladder herbs that are frequently recommended all of them having antibacterial uh, properties specifically um, in terms of the fungal, uh, grapeseed extracts that we talked about earlier can be really effective for that. Other things like caprylic acid, I have never known that to be effective for um, a bladder infection uh, specifically. But again, it is much more commonly bacterial, so that may just be the sample size that I've had. Um, there are actually probiotics, which are potentially beneficial for bladder infections i think through the same mechanism that we talked about they're not colonizing i don't know if it's even considered that there even should be any bacteria necessarily in the urinary tract but these bacteria i i don't know if it's actually fully understood but my belief would be that the mechanism that they work by is that they create things which in turn kill the um the bacteria that tend to reside in the urinary tract. So there's a uh, Lactobacillus uh, ramon, ramonosus, uh, GR1, and L. ruteri RC14. So notice those are very specific strains. Lactobacillus ramonosus and L. ruteri are very broad strains that you would see in many different probiotics, but those are very specific um, strains within strains, substrains of those bacteria which um, I have known people to say that they actually make a difference, which is why I'm listing them. There are other probiotics, for instance, that are supposed to be good for oral health. I didn't list any of them because I've never known anyone to say that it makes any difference for them. I'm also suspicious of probiotics for oral health because usually when you look at those probiotics, 
there'll be kind of the usual, like l and Lactobacillus and Bifobacterium. But all of those are acid-producing bacteria. Right, right. We want this so alkaline. I- yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Maybe they sometimes work for some people, but it kind of doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, these bladder ones potentially do, and I've known some people to say that they really help. So there's something that you might want to consider as well. Um, again, Phymosin Alpha 1, Phymosin Beta 4 for the um, for the immune-boosting anti-inflammatory properties could be really good. And then antibiotics, antifungals. Um, the antibiotics, I would say, are always for acute infections, so I'm not going to comment on those. The antifungals, probably similar to what I was saying earlier, like Nystatin might be a uh, best thing, but fluconazole, I believe, is the most commonly prescribed, again, for uh, those kind of uh, situations. And uh, biofilm disruptors, I have not known them to actually make a difference. I don't, I believe that there probably is some kind of level of biofilm in the urinary tract, but I don't think it's the thing that makes a difference. I would say bladder infections often are more in the acute category, maybe just like ear infections. So why am I bringing them up anyway? I'm bringing them up because there are plenty of people who have chronic UTIs or chronic bladder issues. And that is where I started with saying, maybe you want to consider that it's actually something else. Even if even if it is what you say, I think it's a, um, what's the word? Like a runoff situation. So I think it actually starts in the intestines. It then cross contaminates um, into the bladder through some mechanism. Obviously, women get it more, and it's you know considered that's through sex or hygiene There's a reasons. Hygiene. Yeah, that's a part part of it as well. Yeah, for sure. But I have, I used to have this issue as a man. I don't know, you know, it's, it's it just seemed to me that when my testing was irritated and inflamed, then the um, the urinary tract especially would get it as well. And as soon as I resolved the intestine thing, the urinary tract thing went away. And as I say, I've, you know, numerous women I've recommended to that to as well. And it has a very high success rate. Again, among women who've already tried all the stuff that's supposed to work for the bladder, admittedly. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because so, you, you do have some women out there that are constantly on antibiotics because they're having this thing. So you definitely want to look at what your recommendations are for the intestine because that could be a game changer for some individuals. Yeah, and then the tension is another thing. You know, there often is a uh, correlation with stress. And so, and they don't even have to be mutually exclusive. So if you have a lot of tension um, in your abdomen, then the fascia, which is this very thin but very strong layer that kind of covers everything and keeps everything in shape, can uh, tense up. Fascia tends to constrict in response to trauma and stress. And so it can squeeze various areas, various different um, areas, causing various different problems. We talked about this before, I think in the chronic pain episodes is where I explained it in the most detail. And so, yeah, I would say out of all of these, probably it, it, um, bladder and urinary tract along with sinuses are where it's most likely to actually not be an infection, even though we think it is. And then the intestines is kind of the opposite. It's where it's most likely to be an infection when we don't realize that it is. Yeah. I think speaking to your point on the fascia, because I've got two things that I, I want to say here. To, uh, the With the fascia, um, you know, my trainer, he had me get like this um, like round softball and he makes, he tells me to lay on, lay on it on a mat and just stay there for, you know, a couple of minutes and then move it and do the same to help release the, the fascia and the tension in the belly. And so, you know, it hurts. It hurts a lot. But you, you know, you got to move things around because like you're saying, there is that constriction. Yeah, well, that's the trigger point um, strategy for dealing with uh, fascia constriction. And the fascia often will um, constrict in these certain areas as like a little knot of it. And so the trigger point kind of approach is to work out where that knot is and kind of um, undo it via brute force, it can be effective. And I've utilized it myself on occasion, but my experience and perspective is it's not a long-term strategy. Like the problem comes right back again and you 
kind of have to actually look at rewiring the brain to stop it the from tension. tense tensing in those yeah. uh, ways. But it can definitely provide short term relief, short to medium term, like for a few days or whatever. And my second point to bring up was um, one of the things I found along my journey with having to deal with some of these things at times was a homeopathic med- medicine called cantharis. So I will carry a little vial of that with me whenever I travel because if I feel just this little bit of uncomfortability about something, so I'll use a couple of those and that will also help to alleviate it. So that's something to to look into as well. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't comment on homeopathy. <laughs> um, the one other thing that can sometimes help people in this area is the pain will be, this will not really resolve the infection again, but the pain will be worse the more acidic the urine is. So, uh, for some people, having baking soda to alkalize the urine, the, you know, the, there was a whole movement about 10 years ago of like alkalizing like the whole body as if that was a beneficial thing. I think that's gone out of fashion largely now. And the way that that was usually tested is to see how acidic or alkaline your urine was. So, while you know, say drinking an alkaline liquid and then seeing how alkaline your urine is may not be a great way of testing the whole acid alkalinity of your whole body and it may not even be a valid thing to to try and change. It is valid for the alkalinity or acidity of your urine specifically, right? And so it absolutely is the case if you have like a pH 4.5 urine or pH 5 urine, for instance, you are going to have more pain if you've really got inflammation, irritation, tension, whatever, than if it's pH 7. So that is another thing to consider would be to test the pH of your urine and if it is highly acidic to do something to alkalize it. Won't resolve the problem, but it can provide substantial relief. And then with the list that you have provided, are there any things to watch out for, you know, potential things that could go wrong? Yeah, I think all of what I just said is pretty harmless. Uva Ursi, Solidargo are uh, diuretics. They make your body excrete more liquid and more minerals and stuff along with it as well. So these are not things that you want to have large amounts of for too long. Generally, you want to have a course for like a week or two or something like that, and then you want to stop. Um, That's generally the role of diuretics for certainly herbal diuretics. Obviously, if you're taking a pharmaceutical diuretic and the doctor's telling you to take it for longer, then they're hopefully going to have their eye on that and make sure that it's not excessive. But yeah, you uh, you don't want to take diuretics for too long. Oh, and I know we have a few more areas to cover, but considering where we are at our time, I think we're going to have to put this to a part three. So everyone, thank you for joining us today. Please make sure you check out part one. Thank you for staying with us on part two and make sure you join us for part three because we have more to discuss with other areas and as we alluded to, especially the big one, the small and large intestines. So uh, we thank you all for joining us today. And Elwyn, before we close, is there anything that you want to share with our listeners before we we complete this part two? Yeah, we're also going to be talking about the esophagus, stomach re- uh, the, the stomach acid, acid reflux, GERD, all of that kind of stuff, ulcers, duodenal ulcers. We, we're going to be talking, although, you know, only the um, the non-serious version of those. We're going to be talking about small intestine. We're going to be talking about SIBO, CIFO, LIBO, large intestine, bacterial overgrowth. Um, We're going to be talking about everything related to the digestive tract and also how those digestive tract chronic infections can have a lock-on effect on a lot of other areas that we talked about, how they can infect the sinuses, how they can affect the skin, how they can affect the bladder. So make sure you tune into our next episode for that. Beautiful. And again, as always, thank you for joining us. And please, you know, your support means a lot to us. So make sure you do subscribe, hit the like button, leave your comments below and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss the next episode and many more to come. So we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below, if you want to click on that one and watch that next.